And um, so uh, welcome everyone uh, to the 2021-2022 Humankind Series uh, sponsored by West Shore Community College. My name is Mike Nagel and I teach history and political science here at West Shore. And I'm happy to be involved in tonight's event, which is the first of the 2022 season. So Humankind is West Shore's cultural arts and lecture series. The series includes events like tonight's panel of West Shore faculty focusing on a specific topic. In the past, we've had lectures by outside speakers, but the series also includes musical performances, art exhibits, and feature films. The focus of this year's events is around the concept of movement. Movement impacts our lives in many different ways, and tonight's presentation specifically will focus on change or movement associated with climate change. This evening's presentation will involve a panel discussion with three of our science faculty from West Shore. I'll go ahead and introduce each of the speakers now. Dr. Sonia Seward is a professor of chemistry and serves as the chair of the science division. She earned her bachelor's degree at St. Olaf College in Minnesota and her PhD from Montana State University. Dr. Eric McLaren is our second panelist. He's an associate professor of biological sciences. He earned his bachelor's degree from Michigan State University and his MD from the Wayne State University School of Medicine. The final panelist will be Dr. Paul Belinsky. He's a professor of biology in the science department here at West Shore, and he earned his PhD from the University of California in plant biology. Our format for tonight is for each of the panelists to provide a short presentation, 12, 15 minutes, um, and which should leave us some time for some Q&A at the end. If you do have any questions, please post them uh, in the chat function, uh, and we'll try to address some of the questions that may come up during tonight's presentation. So I'll turn it over to Sonia. She's gonna share her screen. Yep. Does it look good? All right. So with the idea of movement and climate change, there's so many discussions I hear where people get confused. What is the difference between climate and weather? And how do they influence each other? And we had a huge event on January 15th, um, Sunday, just two weeks ago, which was a volcano in T the Republic of Tonga off of the East Coast of Australia and it was the largest eruption in the past 30 years. Now, in relationship to movement, there was a sonic wave that passed over us and was heard as far away um, in England. I mean, it went all over the world along with the tsunamis, but it also relates to the climate and the weather, um, the lightning strikes that occurred because of the volcanic event the ash, the silica ash and the gases present actually created an electrical charge. And there was an amazing amount of electrical activity along with an amazing amount of material put up into our atmosphere, which is going to affect the climate. So meteorology, weather versus climatology. You know, as I've been looking out the window and trying to drive on our roads here in Western Michigan the past few days, what you are observing is primarily meteorology, the weather. But it is also due to our climate. Um, we're measuring, we're examining. I can look outside and see it's cold, even when it's dark outside. The forces and processes that create the properties of the atmosphere. And with my background as a chemist, you know, the dimensionality of the snowflakes versus crystal structures, you can get into so many deep areas of climatology. We're barely covering this all this evening. Um, meteorology is really, what's it doing outside currently or what's it going to do in the next three days, sometimes in the next 30 minutes is a challenge. Um, I took some graduate courses in meteorology three years ago. I was the only non- um, weather channel person in the course. And they all said, if they can tell you, if someone says, we know what the weather is going to be a week and a half from now, they don't, all they know it's winter or it's summer. There's not that much of a chance with that. 
three days is about it. Um, this map here is from a polar vortex. When we were all locked down in May of 2020, you might remember it got extremely cold. And we'll talk about perhaps some of the effects of the climate that caused that meteorological event. Vantusky.com, if you're looking for something about the weather, you can get into immense detail on that website. That's where I go to when someone asks me what the weather is going to be like. Now, climatology, state of the atmosphere for a given time, and a lot of the confusion that's coming into this, what are we comparing to? Are we comparing to ancient Rome? Are we comparing to Antarctica six million years ago? You know, there's all sorts of different time frames. When you hear that the weather is overall warmer or snowier, um, they're comparing it to a 30 year average, just the past 30 years. And we'll be looking to see how that has in fact changed significantly in the past 120 years. So when you think of climate, expected weather during the seasons. None of us here in at West Shore Community College are expecting that it's gonna be 75 degrees and sunny tomorrow. Might be okay. We'd have a lot of flooding going on if that occurred. But the climate's the long term. And, in, and for those of you in my geology course, we talk about all these different spheres of influence, the system analysis, become so important. And then you can also get into the astrophysics that deal with the climate. It can be a very complicated idea. Um, as I mentioned, climatologists, I hear lots of students saying, I'd love to go into climatology. Well, exactly which part you will need. Atmospheric chemistry, lots of calculus, lots of chemistry, computer science. Meteorologists also understand that they have to understand climactic patterns and their impacts on the earth and the different interactions that we have. Um, a woman I met when I was doing my graduate work three years ago is a working meteorologist, but she went back to school to get her geology and meteorology education degrees because this is what she's asked to do is things like we're doing tonight. And you know, how does this influence everything? I could get lost on this slide here for hours, but I won't. Um, 2021 had a lot of climate anomalies. That is, you kept on hearing, it's hotter than here, or the storms are bigger. This is actually put out by the National Oceanographic Association, NOAA, NOAA.gov, you can find tons of materials with. Um, but a couple of the key things with this um, our global surface temperatures, and I'm going to actually give you this, was the sixth highest since 1880. That's 140 years. We're in the top six. And there have been some reasons naturally for some of those, but also for human caused. Um, there was extreme heat waves in Europe and North America, more hurricanes, that is in the Atlantic Basin, more cyclones in the Pacific, Oceania, um, sea ice was at a much, the North Atlantic had more sea ice, or excuse me, less sea ice, but the Antarctic had about the same. So, you know, you can't look at one individualized event. This next slide really shows for me how temperature is changing globally. This is the entire 2021 data in terms of land and ocean temperature percentiles. It's based on data collected by NOAA from 1880 to 2021. Um, and when we talk about an average, right now it was at 55.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Kind of kills me not to talk about it in Celsius, but I'll stick with that. Um, we were up in 2021, almost one and a half degrees Fahrenheit compared to that 20th century average. And, you know, people like to say, well, 0.14 degrees Fahrenheit annually per decade isn't that much. But when you talk about sea level changes and melting glaciers and effect on overall weather patterns, what 
if we look to not just the 20th century average, but the average what's called pre-modern, 1880 to 1900, we are up 1.87 degrees. But I think you can all agree this map is mainly all in reds, meaning we are warmer than average. There's a reason meteorologically on this blue spot in the Pacific. We are currently in La Nina, the cooler Pacific waters, and that has a direct influence. We're supposed to be colder and snowier this year, and guess what? We are. But there are cyclical patterns that are occurring with that, but they're all kind of moving up every year. People looking at data sets, um, instrument, you know, what kind of instrument did they use? Um, since 1850s, they've been tracking um, five different, or was it four, excuse me, different types of instrumentation to take the temperature at different locations and in more locations. In, uh, in more recent times, but I think you can all see there's some uh, overall increase in global temperatures over the past hundred and what seventy years with this, and a lot of these events like this spike here was Krakatoa volcano that created um, oh some serious volcanic activity into our atmosphere. Global warming, climate change, you know, it used to be 10, 15 years ago, we always talked about global warming, greenhouse effect. But what's really been discovered that it's more so climate change because some places are getting colder, some places are getting warmer, weather pattern changes, and that's going to directly affect both what Dr. McLaren and Dr. Belinsky are talking about is some of these things we are human introduced, some are not. Carbon dioxide, um, that's something we can influence by the use of fossil fuels. Um, but every mammal um, exhales carbon dioxide and politely as methane gas also. Natural gas, nitrous oxide, smog, the chlorofluorocarbons, those are refrigerants. I mean, many of these materials were not part. And we were able to track this doing core samples in Antarctica over millions of years, and they're not present in the quantities they are today. So CO2, 1960 to 2021, we've gone from 310 parts per million to over 420 parts per million, which is a huge increase in just 60 some years. Surface temperature of the earth is also increased. Yes, it fluctuates. Yes, you can see cycles. El Nino, La Nina, Mount Pinatubo exploding. There's that was a small cooling effects, but overall there is an increase. Our climate is changing, it's moving. Our precipitation in December, parts of the world were wetter. Parts of the world were drier, but there's a lot of areas we just don't have data analysis for. So, you know, when you look at parts of um, Canada and Brazil and Ant we can't, there's no way at this time with technology to know what the precipitation is. So I'd like to end just talking briefly, will the weather and the climate change due to the volcanic eruption two weeks ago. Um, all the gases and ash, I know um, I've been able to visit Hawaii a few times when there have been VOG alerts, volcanic gases. And that's the primary issue with changes in climate. And the sulfur dioxide really is challenging to breathe. It does cause a global cooling effect. I remember, some of you might not have been born, but Mount Pinatubo in 1991, 20 teragrams of sulfur dioxide. In Tonga, they estimated was only about 0.4 teragrams. So there's not expected to be any significant global cooling or warming due to this volcanic event. 
but acid rain and more regional effects will take place. So, but you have to look at the whole system, all the systems and how they combine together. To end for those of you history, uh, Professor Nagel, I mean, we have all sorts of cyclical events. You know, I like to think about millions of years and thousands of years, whether it be interglacial periods, <laughs> like we had, were covered with a mile of ice 15,000 years ago, to volcanic, to the Romans expanding, that's measurable. So, but then the Roman empires didn't do so well for a while. Another ice age around 1700, something to keep in mind. So for that point, I want you to think as um, Dr. McLaren and Belinsky continue on with this, what will the future bring? Um, we're right here in terms of emissions of carbon dioxide. I personally believe we're sort of in between that right in that black line if we don't do any major significant changes as humankind. So, Professor Nagel, all yours. Thank you, so, uh, Dr. Seward. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. McLaren, who is going to talk. Uh, well, I'll just let you go ahead and take it over. You want to uh, share your screen? Sure. There we go. Hello, everyone. Eric McLaren. I'm an ER physician and more recently a professor of anatomy, physiology, and microbiology. Thank you for joining us. So I'd like to talk to you about uh, climate change, of course, as well as movement, the major uh, theory behind our talk tonight, and its health effects. So according to the World Health Organization, climate change is the single biggest health threat that is facing humanity. Uh, so it's not, it's not a question of if or when this is happening. It's already here. And <clears throat> to, to, to share personal anecdotes, you know, I wasn't around in the late 1970s when I know there was incredible snowstorms that uh, left six and seven feet of snow. And while that doesn't sound that much fun, I think the, the winters like that serve a purpose um, because these mild winters that I've had, I've, I've lived up in Northern Michigan now about 12 years. And I would say a lot of them, we had green Christmases, you know, it's, and I know that's a personal anecdote, but you know, most of us are used to the, the white Christmases in Michigan. And I feel like more and more as the, the earth warms and we have more and more warm years, um, our winters are getting milder. This one seems to be an exception, but it does serve a purpose. Um, you know, if, if the winters continue to get mild, a variety of things can start to move in. And some of them can destroy our crops. Some of them can destroy our trees. And as the people in Colorado know, if you have a huge stand of dead trees from the beetles, well, that serves as a, a huge source of fuel for fires. Or is it more likely that uh, here in Northern Michigan that we'll get really tropical and perhaps see more flooding? That's a possibility as well. If you've lived here just a few years, I know in 2018, the road washed out between Ludington and uh, uh, Manistee. You know, and I remember hearing on the radio that the road had failed. I didn't know what that meant. What does that mean? How can a road fail? Well, it wasn't there. It washed out. It was a huge flood that just completely destroyed 31, and they had to rebuild it. And um, you know, some of the one of the reasons I moved to Northern Michigan is uh, to enjoy beautiful summer days. And I feel like the last couple summers, you know, you go out and think like, oh, it's sunny. It's going to be beautiful, and then it's hazy. Why is it so hazy? And it's because of all the fires out west, the fires in California and Canada. So these are things that are all around us. The, the climate change is here, and uh, you can see it. You can see it in your daily lives. So there's a cost to our impact on the climate. And there's the dollar cost, as you can see in a, a, a diagram like this, where you have I count 18 billion dollar events here. These were all major weather events that happened in 2021. You don't have to go back very far to find huge weather events that happened. And so you look at things like the Gulf Coast. Sure, we understand that there's a hurricane season. That is a cyclical thing. But uh, are the hurricanes getting stronger? 
Are they bringing in more water each time? You know, these cities like Miami and New Orleans and Houston are getting accustomed to billion dollar events. People are dying in floods. People are being displaced and they're having to move to other parts of the country sometimes. Out West, it's generally more an issue of dryness and forest fires that are destroying huge swaths of our forests. And uh, last year, I don't believe it was as bad, but just a few years ago in 2018 was the campfire that destroyed the town of Paradise, just totally leveled it and killed around 80 people. So there, there are these huge weather events that continue to occur and are occurring, are occurring with more and more intensity. And you can look at these things in the immediate effects as in lives lost in each of these things, or you can also look at them in the long term. What are the chronic effects of these things on people's health? So something very recent that happened was in, in Boulder, Colorado. Somehow, miraculously, I believe only one person died, but this fire that started in December, you know, when you would think that probably it would have good snowpack on the ground in Colorado, this fire went through in a matter of hours and destroyed a thousand homes in Boulder, Colorado. Last summer, you might remember this huge heat wave that affected the, uh, the American Northwest and into Canada. And <clears throat> heat related illnesses are especially lethal to the elderly, the socially isolated, and anyone who simply can't afford air conditioning. And of course, up in Vancouver, you know, they're not used to having this amount of heat, you know, these huge uh, fluctuations in temperature. And it can lead to massive loss of life. 600 people died, they estimate, from that heat wave last summer alone. This one I just thought was especially terrifying. Last summer, or late summer, September, in the New York area, suffered record rainfall. And in this area, people live in basement apartments. Can you imagine waking up and the room, the house that you live in, uh, is just filling with water? Something like 11 people died in these basement apartments due to just a torrential rainfall in an area that isn't really accustomed to receiving that much rain. You might remember last summer as well uh, in uh, Europe where they had huge flooding that they have never seen in a century. And you might look at this picture in the left lower and say, wow, those Europeans park their cars funny. But uh, in fact, it would take a massive amount of force to move cars like that. And that's what happened. Just imagine the amount of water and the amount of force it would take to do that to these cars. And just the amount of rain they got turned their highways into rivers. So, you know, and lastly, the, uh, about a year ago in Texas, you know, it's not just forest fires and flooding, but uh, places that are usually relatively warm or, or at least mild in the wintertime, Texas got this cold snap. <clears throat> and so sometimes it's just a matter of people aren't accustomed to the weather changes. And then they do things uh, to try and warm up that uh, are, are fatal, right? A lot of these, these folks, uh, we're sitting in their cars, in their, in their uh, garages. And of course, we in the Midwest know that you only do that if you're trying to kill yourself, right? Sucking in carbon monoxide. But these poor people were just trying to stay warm. So a lot of people froze to death and a lot of people died of carbon monoxide poisoning in Texas uh, because of this cold snap that came through last February. So again, you, you have the immediate effects, hundreds of people dying in forest fires, floods, um, cold snaps, heat-related illnesses, but then you have the more long-term effects. And so The Lancet, which is a major medical publication in England, put out this, this article last September. They estimate that 33,000 people are dying worldwide a year, just simply related to forest fires. And not obviously in the fires itself, but just related to the amount of particulate matter that's released into the air. And you probably remember a few years ago, Australia, the entire continent was practically on fire. In Russia, they're seeing fires in Siberia that they had never seen before. Canada and the Western US, they're seeing record forest fires. Unfortunately, in Amazon, they're primarily burning it to create more cropland. But all of these different fires all around the world are all contributing to this huge amount of particulate matter that's uh, remaining in our atmosphere. 
And the human body is, is uh, accustomed to some degree of dust. We used to run around in the Serengeti Plain and chase our prey. And so we can, we can accommodate some of it, especially the larger stuff. We have this ciliary uh, escalator, all these little hairs along our respiratory tract that can get stuff out. We can trap stuff in our mucus and get it out that way. But once you get fine enough, once the stuff gets really small, uh, it can really get down into your lungs, somewhere around less than 2.5 micrometers. This stuff gets down into your lungs and get to your bloodstream and cause all sorts of health effects, not just lung related effects, probably multiple other things we don't even know about. Obviously, those with pre-existing lung diseases like asthma or COPD are going to be especially at risk the more and more forest fires we have. Um, along the same lines, you have flooding in a lot of places that uh, perhaps aren't accustomed to it or can't accommodate it. And <clears throat> every time there's floods, especially in places like Haiti comes to mind, which does not have a very deep water table, sewage can come to the, uh, the surface and then su the sewage can then, of course, contaminate the drinking water. This leads to outbreaks of cholera, leptospirosis, salmonella, uh, hepatitis, that can then kill multiple people after the major event, after the flooding event, it probably killed a number of people as well. Along the same lines, <clears throat> as the earth warms and as our country warms, it leads to uh, these migrations of pests and vectors. Like for instance, this 80s Egypti mosquito which is known to carry a variety of diseases. So as you can see, as our country warms, uh, it allows these different vectors and insects and parasites to invade further and further north, especially as the winters become more and more mild. So a couple of diseases that are brought by these vectors, for instance, mosquitoes, here's one called chikungunya, which sounds like a nice chicken dish, but actually chikungunya is a pretty nasty virus carried by uh, the mosquitoes, the Aedes aegypti. And as you can see, it's, it's, it's rising. It's, it's range and its habitats getting closer and closer to uh, the Midwest even. Or um, dengue fever is a common tropical illness, but it's making its way further and further north as well. Zika virus made the news. Uh, I want to say that was 2016 or so, it was really big in the news. And Zika virus especially preys on the, the unborn. If a pregnant woman's infected with Zika virus, oftentimes their, their newborn child will have microcephaly, a very small head. And as you can imagine, the human brain won't necessarily be able to develop to its full extent in a very small skull like that. <clears throat> on to migration and movement that occurs due to climate change. Um, the Iraq civil war started in about 2011, well, about the same time as the Arab Spring and many other countries. And it's felt that one of the major events that brought this on was drought. And if you look at this map of Syria here, you can see there doesn't appear to be a lot of uh, arable land, or it's become a place that's become desertified. And when that happens and your food sources run out and perhaps you have high unemployment and a repressive dictator, then you have all the, the ingredients for a civil war or an uprising. And that's what occurred. And to those who wanted to stay and fight, they did. Um, but for most of them, for a lot of migrants, uh, they decided to leave. And so you probably remember around 2015, Europe saw a huge influx of migrants. Um, primarily coming through Turkey and through Greece. And so this is, a, this is a, a situation where these people don't really have anywhere to go. They are fleeing war, and sometimes these conflicts are brought about by drought and climate change. Sometimes they're fleeing simply the climate change itself. Their homes are being um, drowned out by the rising sea levels or where they live, they can no longer grow crops that they used to be able to grow. So we live in the Anthropocene. <clears throat> and if that's the first time you've heard that term, it's the age of man. 
we uh, it's the age of man and the man's effects, well, humankind rather, humankind and, and humans effects on, um, on the earth. So we're seeing desertification. You can just look out in the American West and, and see just large swaths of desert and a lack of arable land uh, and a lot of a lack of drinking water in much of the Southwest. Uh, you can look at a country like Bangladesh, which has about 164 million people. It's about half the population in the United States packed into a, a country the size of the state of Iowa. Right, so imagine half the population in the United States packed into Iowa alone. And much of Bangladesh is at risk of serious flooding. The entire country is sort of based around a delta. And they have become accustomed to living with flooding to some extent, but eventually the whole country could go underwater. The Pacific Islands are another uh, classic example. As sea levels rise, these islands are going to disappear. And where are these people going to go? You know, you've seen a lot of them try to get asylum in places like Australia, which have very strict laws and aren't very welcoming. And that's true of a lot of places around the world, but they haven't been very welcoming to migrants, um, regardless of why they're leaving their homeland. So as we move forward in the Anthropocene, I think what you'll see is that human beings are going to be following food and opportunity. And so if you look at this map in the left lower part of the screen here, the estimate is that uh, much of where we grow our crops, like in the United States today, is going to lose the ability to do that um, because of desertification and other reasons. Um, which reminds me, I should probably buy some land in Montana. Montana looks pretty good uh, looking at that map there. And we should probably stay friends with our friends to the north in Canada. That looks like it's going to be the breadbasket. But you can, almost, you can almost look at these migration routes and the map on the right lower here, and it's almost as if these, these folks already know, right? They're, they're migrating towards uh, perhaps what will be the better part of the world by 2050 with uh, more and more arable land and ability to, to grow crops. Um, we're all familiar with uh, many people coming to our southern border looking for a, a better life. The same thing is happening in, uh, <clears throat> in Africa and Asia and, and the Middle East as they head to Europe for a better life. So lastly, but not least, of course, is mental health. You know, imagine the, the, the strain and the toll that this is happening, uh, that this is occurring with, with all these migrants of climate change. Um, I mean, imagine if your house burned down. I mean, wouldn't that be an incredible, stressful upheaval in your life, that alone? Uh, you're displaced, perhaps you got to go live with your in-laws. I mean, how terrible would that be? Um, but beyond that, uh, even there's also a loss of identity that a lot of times these people suffer. They're expected to assimilate or become similar to the new uh, country that they've had to move to. They're, expe they're expected to accustom to this house, to the new customs. And you know, for the first wave of migrants, it can be very, very difficult. Learning a brand new language, um, you know, typically their children do better than picking up a new language, but then, but then what? Do they lose their culture? You know, a lot of different things about culture are wrapped up in language. And as generations go by in a new place, they may forget their old language and their old customs. And I think a lot of us here in the United States can't really relate to this, but it reminded me a little bit of this picture on the far right, which is of the Dust Bowl that occurred in the 1930s in the Great Plains. And perhaps you've read Giant Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath. It reminded me of that and the Okies, the people in the Great Plains that had to leave because they couldn't grow crops anymore. They couldn't live there anymore. They all made a mass migration out West <clears throat> and they too, encountered a lot of hostility, a lot of resistance, and they were practically slave labor for a lot of the farmers in California. So how do we tackle these challenges? I don't know. Here's a smiling puppy, though. So that's that's something cute to look at. But but uh, seriously, um, well, we can adapt. I mean, it's, again, it's not a, it's not a question of whether or not climate change is happening. It's here. It's, it's happening around us. The good news is human beings are exceptional at adapting. You know, no other species has been to Mount Everest and Antarctica 
and to the moon and to the bottom of the ocean, right? We are actually very good at adapting. So what we need to do is, of course, reduce our dependency on fossil fuels, which will therefore reduce the amount of emissions we're putting into the air. Um, when it comes to the health-related effects, of course, we have to prepare. We have to adapt to the fact that perhaps new vectors are coming in, bringing in new diseases, and to expect them and learn how to treat them. Um, and when it comes to the climate migrants, uh, I think the minimum we can do is empathize from with them and to learn from them. And uh, with that, I will turn it back over to you, Mike. Well, that was great. Much, much appreciated. Uh, so if you could stop sharing your screen, um, we can then uh, transfer over to Paul, if you want to go right ahead. So, all right, hand it over to you. Cool. Yeah, I certainly appreciate ending on a smiling puppy. That That's probably one of the best ways to approach uh, climate change talks. So I, I like to... Oops, you guys still able to see things? Okay, so my computer just went weird. Cool. Well, um, I like to uh, talk about climate change by first referencing something that we're all very familiar with, snow plows. So uh, there, there can be a lot of like noise surrounding the idea of climate change and how this occurs. Uh, but I, I like to draw inspiration from what happens here every winter. These uh, trucks moving around with tons of salt, put salt on the roads in order to change the chemistry of the ice on the roads. When you change the chemistry of the ice on the roads, you, you change its properties, you change its melting point, and therefore you create uh, much safer driving conditions, which we could use a lot more of on a lot of our different roads. But the same thing applies with air chemistry. When we see a change in air chemistry, we're gonna see a change in the properties of the air. We're gonna see a change in the climate. And right now what we're seeing with climate change is that there's a fast change in air chemistry. Therefore, we expect a fast change in climate. And I thought since Professor Nagel is our host for this evening, I'm gonna to have to draw on a little bit of history to see whether history has any clues as to what happens to life on planet Earth when we see this fast change in climate. So for that, we can take a look at the history of life on this planet. Going back to the early days of Earth, about 4.6 billion years ago, to some of the more recent times when we see a lot of fossils being created, particularly around this Cambrian explosion in the 540 million years ago, 542 to be exact. From that point on, from 542, we see tons and tons of fossils in the historical record, some really crazy creatures some wacky underwater monsters just like this, some really crazy uh, amphibian relatives like this tictilic here, uh, even some things that are alive today like this beautiful bobtail squid or some of these alien plants that this picture was taken here in Michigan. Uh, those of you who are big Star Wars fans, these are the plants that are used as the backdrop for Yoda's planet of Dagobah because they look so foreign to us. So life has existed for a long time, it's created fossils for a long time. What can those fossils tell us? Can we look at the fossil record to try to infer something about what has happened in the past with life when climate changes quite rapidly? I'll take a quick aside here because uh, I want to make shameless plug. Uh, at Westshore, we've got a pretty neat fossil collection. So these are some pictures of some of my favorite fossils taken by one of our students, Emily McGaffigan, who hopefully is on the call somewhere. But with our fossil collection, you can actually touch some of the exoskeletons of things that were alive millions of years ago, like this starfish relative that looks quite like a plant. In fact, its common name is the sea lily, the crinoids. Or you can see some pretty wicked looking fish jaws, or even some really, really cool ammonite shells, things that were on planet Earth for a very, very long time. Then unfortunately today, there's not a lot of them left, only one living fossil of the, of the Nautilus. Um, and I was supposed to address in my talk somewhere about uh, something about fossil fuels. So I think it's really important to clarify why we call them fossil fuels. So let's pretend for a moment that we've got a tree, a tree in the forest, right? It's not going to fall. We're not going to ask whether it makes sound or not. But we will ask what happens when it dies. Nowadays, when that tree dies, 
fungi will start to break it down. There are things that can eat it on this planet and recycle that carbon. We have cool mushrooms, particularly love eating mushrooms. Um, and, and eventually that log gets recycled into the air. But what happened on earth before those fungi evolved to be able to break down those trees? Well, when a tree fell down in a forest, it stayed there. And then another tree fell down and stayed on top of it. And another tree on top of that. Compare it to something today, right? We, we know that these plastics that we create are not being broken down by mother nature. And therefore every bit of plastic that we throw out there, it's gonna stay there up until it gets compressed under a mountain. Well, back in the day, over 450 million years ago, trees were the original plastic. They would not be broken down. They were creating these fossils where huge forests would fall and nothing could break them down. Well, when you take that forest, bury it under a mountain with huge amounts of pressure, bam, you've got our sources of fossil fuels, whether there be coal or uh, natural gas or, uh, or oils. This is where all of our reserves come from. So technically, we're not creating any more fossil fuels because guess what? Those mushrooms, those fungi, have been around since you know, something like 380 million years ago. So the creation of fossil fuel reserves have stopped. This is why fossil fuels are a non-renewable resource. Not only do they take forever to create, but on top of that, the stuff that used to be unbreakable, Mother Nature has solved. We're able to break down trees, get resources from them, and recycle them into, an, into the environment. So let's go back and talk about what's going on, uh, what information can we gather by looking at the fossil record? Because you can have people who are extremely devoted to trying to figure out uh, counts of species in the fossil record, right? We can go back and literally count how many different things existed over time. And we can actually create a pretty cool graph where we plot biodiversity, so how much life diversity we have over that 542 million year time period. Well, one of the cool things for the planet, you'll notice that the fossil records indicating that diversity of life is increasing over time. I love that. I think that's pretty great, right? Like as time increases, uh, species occupy different niches, and we're, we're generally seeing this overall big trend to increase. But as these yellow arrows indicate, you can see that there are very distinct points in our past where when we've been increasing, we dip very sharply, right? And if I'm picking a time period to be alive, it's not going to be during one of those dips, right? If we look at human populations in the past, if you're looking at uh, how human populations have done over the last uh, couple thousand years, I don't think you want to pick the Black Plague as the time that you want to be alive. You don't want to be in um, you know, Central Asia when the Mongolian horde is coming through. That's not a time period where you want to be alive. And so these yellow arrows show our five plus one, because this one here has kind of a shoulder, our five plus one historical extinctions. So from that fossil record, we can tell that there have been five major time periods in Earth's history where the reset button has been hit on life. Well, what can we tell caused those events? Now, some of them are far in the past. So sometimes we have you know, good guesses, sometimes not so great. The further back we go, it can get a little bit harder. But scientists have come up with uh, reasonable explanations for what drove all of these different events. So the first being the Ordovician Silurian extinction event. Well, that one was caused by a massive glaciation. So during this first extinction event, it seems like the polar ice caps got absolutely massive. Earth got really, really, really cold, really, really, really fast. That rapid climate change caused a decrease in diversity of something like 30% of all living species, at least in the ocean, going extinct. And think about how catastrophic that would be for life today, right? If 30% of all the species that lived in the water today just disappeared, think about human food sources. Think about the ecology of the environment, right? So much collapses. We can even estimate from this Ordovician Silurian extinction that something that it took something like 5 million years to recover. 
And I'll have to check with uh, Dr. McLaren here, but I'm pretty sure the human lifespan is a little bit less than 5 million years. And so we might, you know, if we want to see a planet that's thriving, we, we don't want something like this to happen, particularly in our lifetimes. The next, the late Devonian extinction. Well, here we see that there was actually uh, rapid changes in sea levels across the planet. And in particular, we see a drop in oxygen levels. As you can imagine, if oxygen levels drop in the water, well, then the fish, the different organisms, they're not going to be able to breathe as well. And this created quite a strong drop, not quite as strong as the massive glaciation, but again, something closer to 20% of all marine species gone overnight. The Permian Triassic. Now, this is this middle one where uh, the estimates say something between 50 and 60% of all marine life disappeared with even stronger uh, or even larger estimates for stuff on land. That one gets the nickname of the great dying. I sure don't want to live during the great dying. So what the heck caused the great dying? Well, as something uh, so catastrophic, you might expect that there might be a couple different reasons. Looking back at this uh, Permian Triassic boundary, we actually see a huge amount of volcanic activity. Volcanic activity in a region called the Siberian Traps. So this is the, this massive complex of volcanoes out in Siberia that were just going off for a period of like 2 million years. And above them were these massive fossil fuels stores. So when you have volcanoes going off of buried oil fields, everything's gonna burn, right? Like that, I do not wanna be above ground on, on that day. Over time with those volcanoes releasing all these gases, CO2 levels across the planet increased quite, quite drastically. When there's more CO2 in the air, that leads to the acidification of the water. So not only did we have really, really hot on fire things on land, but that also caused pH changes in the water. And you can just ask how the corals feel today about changes in the pH in the water. They don't feel much about it because they're dead. Now, again, from this massive extinction event, it takes a really long while to recover. Scientists estimate that after the great dying, it took something like 10 million years to recover, which again is even longer than the human lifespan. For our last two extinction events, we're getting closer to the one that I'd imagine most folks recognize. The Triassic Jurassic was again a massive volcanic eruption, a series of them over a period of time with increasing CO2 levels and a massive drop off in uh, biodiversity across the planet. And then the one that we all likely know from whatever Disney movie or uh, cartoon, the um, Cretaceous Paleogene, the one that was caused by the asteroid that landed off the Yucatan Peninsula where we can still, still see the um, location where that asteroid hit, that resulted in the end of the dinosaurs, even though they're kind of on their way out, um, that, that also had a pretty strong reset button, right? But it's crazy to think about this. We saw a stronger reset button in terms of species diversity on this planet from increasing CO2 levels than a giant rock hitting our planet. That's gotta be pretty striking, right? Like CO2 levels, rapid increases in this can cause more extinction than we see by asteroids hitting us. That's a whole new spin on a lot of those sci-fi movies, the deep impact things that talk about asteroids hitting us that we gotta be worried about when really, maybe it's our cars and our lifestyles in terms of how much fossil fuels we use and how much carbon we output. Now, this image is kind of cool. Um, it's a little complicated, so I don't want to go into too much detail. This is from a recent publication here, looking at average temperature since the hitting of the asteroid 65 million years ago. And we know that Earth's climate changes a lot over long periods of time. And it's that gradual change that allows species to adapt slowly. Quick change, bad, don't have much chance to adjust. Whereas if something is happening over a longer period of time, uh, species can still survive. They don't go extinct, right? So it's always these rapid changes that are bad. Earth has existed as a warm house or a hot house uh, over the last 
uh, oh, oh, 65 million years ago to 35 million years ago, there was a period where planet Earth was quite hot when, when mammals were starting to become more prominent. But since then, we've really gone on a cold streak. From our warm house, we then went into a cool house period. And then even more recently, over the last 5 million years, we've gone from our cool house to ice house. And it's during that ice house conditions that our species, Homo sapiens, and all of our relatives, Homo habilis, the, the tool man, the handyman, and all the things that we would recognize as, you know, kind of human or humanoid, that's what, that's the environment that we entered this planet on, a cold environment. Well, over the last 20,000 years, we've seen kind of a bump up. So from this, these ice house conditions, we're going more towards like, you know, the edge of the cool house from icy to cool. And in the last 150 years since the, uh, you know, industrial revolution, our temperatures have been increasing. And using uh, models based on carbon outputs, we're primed to go from cool house conditions to potentially warm house or even hot house. That's a rapid, rapid change, right? From going from ice to hot glass shatters. It doesn't feel good when you do it, right? Like th these are conditions that are not very conducive to life. And if we care about this planet, if we care about all the beautiful biomes that we live in, right? Here in Michigan, we've got our temperate forests, our uh, across the Great Plains, you've got the grasslands. I grew up in the scrublands of California, very, very unique, very cool. The, the taigas up north of us in Canada, tundras even north of that. If we care about all these environments, and I most certainly do. I mean, my favorite thing is the spring and summertime here in Michigan, going out and identifying all kinds of different plants and the different species that exist on these specific different plants. If we want these ecosystems to survive, the ecosystems that we rely on for our cooling, for our food, for our enjoyment, we certainly need to do something about this rapid climate change. Because if history is any indicator, any rapid change is going to result in a rapid loss of biodiversity. And I don't want to be around for any extinction event, much less something that's compared to the great dying. So just like uh, Dr. McLaren did, I think it's appropriate to end a very depressing talk with pictures of puppies. Um, so here's you know, a picture of the beautiful Michigan hiking here in the wintertime with a dog exploring the beautiful, beautiful woods. And this is what I want to say, right? This is what we're, we're aiming for to keep around for posterity when we talk about trying to combat climate change. And I think with that, I think I'll end with questions because we're, we're coming up close on the time, yeah? Okay. No, that sounds great. This has been really, really helpful and educational, and, and I, I've learned a lot. Um, what I'd like to see is, is maybe um, if people have some questions, uh, if you can put those in the, probably in the chat. Um, I don't think they need to go into the Q&A. There was one that I did want to ask, uh, and this is actually for Sonia. Sonia, you mentioned, I, and I grew up on the West Coast, and so El Nino and La Nina were, were um, big events. Um, is there an explanation? Why, why, does, why do we have El Nino years and La Nina years? Could, is, do we know? Go for it, Paul. Sure, it, it has to do with, uh, so I grew up in Southern California and I moved to Southern California during one of the most gnar gnarly El Nino events. I, I remember uh, starting the third grade and it was just absolutely pouring. The streets couldn't handle the amount of water. Uh, the El Nino and La Nina events are, are due to uh, climatic events in the Pacific as to whether they absorb or uh, like cyclical events that I think they're typically on something like 10 year scales uh, where they, oh, seven year scales, or see, been a little while since uh, that California education uh, <laughs> kept me privy to, to the El Nino and La Nina events, but uh, they're regular cycles that cause more water to be dumped on either the US or Australia. So when we have more water in the Western US, Australia is going through a drought. More water for us is correlated to El Nino, and then La, La Nina are the dry points for the Western US, and then Australia is getting dumped on in terms of water. So 
this has to do with overall global patterns. Okay, all right. Well, we do have a couple of questions. Here's one, um, and I wanna make sure that I get the, the language right here. Um, what can we be doing now to address some of these climate issues? Who would like to tackle that one? We unfortunately live in an area where we need heating and cooling and not much public transportation, but we can think about, you know, but it costs money and you have to make life decisions. You know, I'm, you know, whether it be different vehicles or people laugh at me, my mother needs to be prepared. I keep my, where I live at 59 degrees overnight, you know, you know, we just have to learn to perhaps decrease our overall use. And I do just fine, just put on another pair of socks and a sweatshirt. Paul, Eric? <laughs> yeah, I agree, uh, Sonia. It does unfortunately take some upfront capital, but for instance, at my house, I have geothermal heat. I don't burn fossil fuels to heat my house. I have solar panels, which takes care of my electric bill from April through October, at least, through the sunny months. Um, and uh, as you've probably seen in the news lately, uh, Ford and GM are gonna become major producers of electric cars. And uh, I did used to have a Prius. They didn't, it didn't do well in Northern Michigan in the winter time, but uh, I do plan to get an electric truck as soon as uh, one of the American automakers makes one for it that, that looks pretty good. Um, so Paul, did you wanna jump in at all or? I think, that, I think those comments pretty much summarize it, so. Okay. So there are things that we can do in our daily lives just little things uh, that can that can be built on and, and we could we could have an impact. So, okay. Um, here's another question. Is there, a, or what is the prediction time if we are going, um, what do they think when we might hit that hothouse point? Is there a prediction for that? Yeah, so the models are saying that sometime in uh, between 20, uh, 2200 to 2300, we'd be full-blown hothouse if we continue as we are. Uh, and that would obviously be fairly catastrophic for biodiversity on planet Earth. And there's a, thank you. Uh, there's a question for uh, Sonia. Uh, a student's brother studies hydrology. How do you think climate change is affecting that field? Water's key. We can't live more than three days without water. And there's so many places of the world, including the US, that is already running out. I mean, I had a friend, sorry, uh, Dr. McLaren, but in Montana, they dug a well over 1800 feet and never hit water, mm -hmm. you know, and they were, yeah. So you're like, but I would choose to live there also. But, you know, trying to find water and more so keeping what water we have pure rather than worrying about trying to clean up what we do have and where it's at. And I mean, California there, they've tried, they've talked about literally mm -hmm. big pipelines to uh, California. Big veto no for this area, but there's people in desperate need and maybe less green grass. Yeah, there was a, a, a lot of talk, the, the states in the, the, uh, the Great Lakes were talking at one point uh, about making sure passing legislation to ensure that uh, Great Lakes water was not shipped as a commodity to other parts of, of the United States or other parts of North America, like in Canada. Okay. All right, um, so Eric, here's a question. Um, how does global warming uh, impact people with environmental allergies? I imagine they're gonna get worse, unfortunately. Of course, it, it depends on what exactly you're allergic to. You know, some people are allergic to grasses, to trees, to ragweed late in the season. But uh, if there are you know, perhaps more invasive species that move in because of the climate change and it increases their range uh, and you're allergic to them, then that's going to be uh, hard on you. And of course, again, as I mentioned in my, in my uh, talk, just the amount of particulate matter that's in the air too is, is, is going to elicit a lot of allergies in people as well. Thank you. Um, here's another question, and this can go to, to anybody here. Um, I don't know if someone has watched Cowspiracy on uh, Netflix, but uh, this question is, how does farm and meat, farmland and meat production of impact climate change? 
Want to take it, Paul? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, anytime we have to uh, funnel food or funnel calories through animals to eat meat, it actually takes 10 times as much plant product to feed the cow and then to feed yourself. Beef in particular is the worst culprit in terms of greenhouse gases. It takes the most energy to, to produce a pound of beef compared to any of the other foods. So farmland and meat production are, are actually really big drivers of climate change. But I wanna flash a little bit of hope here uh, because you know obviously like, can we tell planet earth, you gotta give up meat tomorrow? I think that there would be a lot of protest to that. But what if you could grow your meat more efficiently through lab production? Uh, actually, my old uh, grad school roommate currently is working for a company that's trying to grow milk in a lab by producing those casein proteins in um, a bioreactor. And they're going to be producing cheese from that rather than having to go through all the energy to produce the feed for the cow that would then feed the cow and then produce the milk and transport the milk and all of the extra fossil fuels that are expended in that effort, we may be able to maintain our quality of life through all of these cool scientific endeavors uh, that allow us to reduce our carbon emissions while keeping our uh, gluttonous habits of eating meat and cheese. And I, I mean, I've got chocolate milk right next to me. I can't give up milk. <laughs> Okay, that's great. Now here's a, here's a really good question that actually deals with our theme of movement. Um, so with the changes in weather over the past few years uh, and even into the future, is it possible the Northern states will potentially do a swap with Southern states with the current weather changes? So this, this kind of relies, can, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take a stab at this. Okay. This relies a little bit on the climate modeling um, and it's not so much that they're going to do a, a swap, right? The, the southern states would become much more desertified. And the northern states, depending on what part of the country you're in, um, they will differ. They, they can get hotter. They can, some of them might get a little bit more different. In particular, uh, one of the things that maybe should bring Michiganders a little bit of solace is one of the regions that seems to be more human habitable over the next 50 years with climate change is the Great Lakes area. But I'll point this out. If the rest of the country is getting less human habitable and the Great Lakes are becoming more human habitable, where do you think the people are going to go? And, and how are they going to grow the food and get the water and everything? Exactly. Else? I think every, every single semester I ask that question, folks say that one of the greatest things about this area is that there's no traffic, there's no congestion, there's no people, you just get beautiful nature. Well, what if Texas and California uproot and have to come to Michigan? Be a lot more people in the state. So we, if, if you are interested in preserving the beauty that is here, we also have to make sure that other people's beauty away from here gets preserved as well. Um, I was listening on, uh, I heard an NPR story in the state of Michigan. I think uh, there were a certain number of deaths and a certain number of births in the state uh, last year. And the number of deaths exceeded the number of births by, uh, I don't know, what was it like 10, six to 10,000, somewhere in there. Does that sound about right? I can't remember the exact figures, but yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Michigan lost um, another uh, congressional seat with the last census. So um, here's a question, and I think it's a good one. Do you think nuclear power is a viable option to helping resolve problems related to global warming and energy production in that? So I was just talking with that with some students today, and they asked that question. You know, the most common is why can't we just shoot the nuclear waste to outer space? Well, that's no, not going to work. But, you know, if we can come up, we do have some uses of some of what is now waste products um, that is used. But the big thing is, you know, in Fukushima, Japan, they never thought that a 50 what, foot tsunami would ever wipe it out. But you need water to operate a nuclear plant. So energetically per kilogram of the uranium or whatever materials, there's yeah, it's great. There's less open pit mining, there's everything, but then there's what if, you know, I was alive and sort of remember when Three Mile Island happened. Mm -hmm. I do remember Chernobyl. I mean, who's to say? I mean, it would be a devastating, huge 
problem, but yep. no good answer. You guys? Right. It's why I think if, if nuclear power can be done safely, um, then it's it's a great clean energy source. Um, but I think I think we're better off going with solar, wind, geothermal, things that we know don't create toxic waste and, and can't create meltdowns that potentially put a lot of people's lives at risk. One thing that's nice about uh, the new addition here at West Shore, the, the, the building where I am um, has geothermal heat uh, and it's a, a green building. So now um, what I'm going to do is, is I, I don't want to run too long. I'd like that to, to address another question. We've been losing some people. So here's one last question from student. Um, is the production of green alternatives such as electric cars a viable solution given the amount of water in production alone? Is there a more, more green way to run our factories? The electricity for the electric cars has to come from somewhere. Um, it is a lot more efficient. I know where I live in Ludington, we've actually, the building I live in has a half a block of rooftop. And we have looked at the past few years of putting solar panels on top and hooking it up to our electrical grid and having that as a backup. Um, there becomes issues though, you know, depending on how we're, you know, are you using more fossil fuels to generate more electricity or, you know, but then you're not having carbon dioxide there. It's a big cycle of so many spheres of influence on it. Eric or Paul, do you want to jump on that one? Or? <laughs> I, I think that all in all, we have to get better at doing the renewable and reusable aspect of things and electric cars do nudge us in that direction. We have to align incentives in terms of our economy to make sure that we're not it, it, promoting ways of living that uh, are dead ends that just end up in, in more uh, CO2 being emitted. We have to build a, a, an economic model that really tries to be cyclical rather than uh, reaching an end point and dumping it into the atmosphere. So uh, I think that, that electric cars are a good nudge towards that and maybe an intermediate to allow us to bridge the gap from our fossil fuel cars uh, to whatever the future may hold. But there's also issues with a lot of the rare metals and where they're mined that go into these. I mean, there's so many issues that go along with this. And, but I personally am going to be getting a hybrid, not probably a pure electric one. I, family in Minnesota, the batteries will not work. <laughs> well, I think this has been great. This has really been enlightening. I learned a lot and I wanna thank each of the panel members and everyone here in the audience. But I did, did have a favor for everyone before we, we leave. Um, as soon as you leave this Zoom session, you'll be asked to click on a link to a survey, which will allow you to comment on the quality of the presentation. This is very important for West Shore to keep this data, um, and it's, it helps us to plan future events. So please let us know what you liked about this presentation, as well as any opportunities um, for improvement, uh, ways that we can improve the viewer experience. And one other thing I would be remiss if I didn't mention the upcoming Humankind events, which will actually be taking place at Manistee's Vogue Theater. We have a great partnership with the Vogue. So you can visit the Humankind webpage for a full list of films and a brief description. But just for now, on Tuesday, February 8th at 7 o'clock p.m., the Florida Project will be shown. Then the following week on Wednesday, February 16th, the World's Fastest Indian will be shown at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. You can see a full listing of these films and there'll be some additional ones. Um, and upcoming humankind events by visiting the West Shore Community College website. Once you arrive at the website, choose humankind under the community drop down menu. Well, thanks again to each of you and to everyone who participated in this. I uh, hope you learned a lot. I know I sure did. Uh, have a great evening, everyone, and, and stay warm. Okay, take care. <laughs>